Yeah, so he enters Jerusalem riding on a donkey, and people welcome him waving the palm leaves, waving, waving the palm leaves, and they're throwing their garments on the ground as they welcome with the red carpet, the own, their own red carpet that they have laid out for the king to enter the city of Jerusalem to be their king. And this is the beginning of the final week of Jesus Christ. Uh, and this is the single most monumental event in Christian history. So this week during our Sunday school Zoom meeting with the elementary kids, uh, we have a brilliant student and he asked me, Pastor James, which holiday is more important, Christmas or Easter? And I said, you can't have one without the other, but if I may weigh in, this is crucial, this is central, this is critical, and this is the one single most monumental moment in, not only in Christian history, but in all of humanity. For the perfect sacrificial lamb has been offered on the altar, on the cross, as a ransom to save the lost. So to give you the timeline of this week, so as we prepare our minds and our hearts for the final week, Passion Week, and I hope that we can take part in the suffering of Jesus Christ by sacrificing what we dear most, what we hold dear most, and that is our media, and, and frankly, I think it's taking over our hearts and our minds and our time, um, and I think it's good exercise that we exercise this week to lay that aside to focus on the Word of Jesus Christ. But as we prepare for this final week, let me just give you a little timeline. So Jesus enters Jerusalem on Sunday. So this is Sunday. He enters Jerusalem and everyone's welcoming Him. And then the next day, on Monday, Jesus cleanses the temple uh, for the final time. So He goes in and they have made the temple, the house of prayer, into, into something else. They have turned it into a marketplace and Jesus turns that around, cleanses the temple, and then the next day on Tuesday, Judas, one of the disciples, seeks to betray Jesus. So he's meeting with the, the leaders, and they plot uh, this plan, this evil plan to betray Jesus for some silver. And then on Thursday, Jesus commands the disciples to prepare for Passover feast. So this whole Passover week is... It's also a significant week for the Israelites because they're preparing for this one single important holiday in Israel history, which is the Passover. And Jesus commands the disciples to prepare for the Passover, find him, a, uh, find him a place where they can all gather to eat. And on Thursday night, and we've been preaching um, you know, on these passages for the several past weeks, Jesus eats with the disciples. Jesus gives the final discourses about what is about to take place, the betrayal, and the promise of the, the Holy Spirit, and how He must be killed, and how He is going away, and all of that. This course is happening on Thursday night. And what happens after the meal, after the discourses? They all move to the mountain to pray. And Jesus prays, the final prayer of the priestly, high priestly prayer, John 17. And then Thursday night, late Thursday night, he is betrayed. So Judas brings the army, he is taken um, to the officials. And Thursday night, the Jewish leaders question him. They try him. So Annas and Caiaphas, they, they question him and they, they try to try him so that he could be uh, prosecuted. And then, because they can't really do more than what they want to do because it's the holiday and they don't want to get their hands dirty, they hand Jesus over to the Roman authorities. So late night, really, really late night, um, on Thursday night, they bring Jesus to Pilate and Pilate says, all right, you know what, I'm in my pajamas, come back in the morning, meet me in the morning, and we'll do this together. So Finally, Friday morning at the sunrise, Pilate sentences Jesus to death. And in the morning of Friday, Friday around 9 a.m., Jesus is crucified. And then after he is crucified, 
there is a three hours of darkness. From noon to about 3 p.m., there's this, this crazy darkness. Everything just shuts down. All the heavens, all the sunlight, everything just closes in. Everything is dark. And then what do we see happening in the temple? The veil that separated the, the common people entering into the holies of holies is ripped from top to bottom. This thick of a garment, a curtain that is this thick so that no one can accidentally run into or go into the place of holies of holies is ripped. Supernaturally, God just rips as He rips His Son on the cross from top to bottom signifying that the sacrificial lamb has been offered. And then they take him down in the afternoon and they bury him before the, the, the sunset. And then all of Israel, because of their holiday custom, they eat the sanctioned Passover lamb at sunset. And then the whole Passover feast begins. Is this coincidence? Is this by chance that all of this took place in this final, final days during the, the Passover holiday? I don't think so. Jesus himself became the sacrificial lamb. The perfect sacrifice that was sacrificed once and for all, for all of mankind, so that we may enter the place of holies of holies. And all this took place this final week. So when you think about it, you guys, this is... An important week. And I pray that we could really come into the Lord in prayer, in the Word of God. And the whole Korean side is doing a week-long early prayer meetings. And if you want to take part in that, you're more than welcome to do that. In the morning, the whole church is going to devote in prayer in the Word because we want to implant in our hearts what Jesus had done this week to give us life. So as, as we have preached in, in John, the Gospel of John, I meditated again this week as I was preparing for this um, Palm Sunday message, and I saw something amazing this week. You know, I always knew, but it was this week that I finally saw there was, there was a vocabulary that kept popping up on and again. And I was able to see the main conflict point where everything diverged on. So as these, these several final weeks of Jesus Christ was happening, and as Jesus was talking with the disciples, as He is being tried, as He, be, as he is being de, uh, betrayed, I saw this one main problem that was constantly being at the center of all of the arguments, and everything just centered around this, diverged on this. And the tension rose around this point, and anger brew at this central point, which eventually crucified Jesus Christ. So what do you think is the eye of the storm? What do you think is the very, at the very heart and the very center of this final week that eventually crucified Jesus Christ? As I read, I saw the whole thing boil down to this one repeated vocabulary. King. It is the word king. So it was the fight for kingship and for the kingdom. It was fight over the throne and over the crown. As I was reading all of the chapters in, in John, this word king popped up over and over and over again. And we're going to go through the different passages, but as we do that, I want you to keep in mind, keep your eye on this word, king. And I hope that you can follow through. So let's look at today's text. John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verses 12 through 15. Let me read to you from the ESV. The next day the large crowd, so this is Jesus entering Jerusalem. The next day the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm leaves and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he, who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your King is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. So let's 
So this whole final Passion Week begins with people proclaiming what? Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even to the king. So other translations say, indeed the king of Israel. Blessed is the king of Israel. NIV translates, blessed is the king of Israel. Or King James says, the king of Israel. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the king of Israel. So they were welcoming Jesus as their king, king of Israel. And people recognize this, that Jesus will be the one. He will be the king, the one, who will deliver them out of the hands of Rome. So let's fast forward. Fast forward to the trial with Pilate. And Pilate is the Roman governor of that time. Fast forward with me to John chapter 18. So this is how this week ends. So the Jewish people try him. And then because they couldn't really crucify Jesus with the Jewish leadership, they hand him over to Pilate. And this is what he says. John chapter 18, verse 33. So look at what he is asking. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Are you the king of the Jews? Verse 34, Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate, asked, uh, then Pilate said to him, So, are you a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. So, what was Pilate's one concern? And as this whole stir happened, as this crowd gathered, all the Jewish leaders, all the chief priests were just shouting and they were knocking on the doors of Pilate and they were just bothering him and saying, you know what, we have this huge criminal. You have to try him. You have to crucify him. There's mobs outside standing. And then what is the one thing that he asks about Jesus Christ? What is the one concern that he has? over all of this that is taking place. Are you the king of the Jews? And then Jesus says, you know what? If I am the king of the Jews, if I am of this world, my, my servants, all my armies, all my servants will fight for me so that I'm not handed over, but I'm not of this world. He's like, and Paul's like, no, 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 no. Are you, so are you the king? Answer me. Don't say any, anything else. Just answer me. And Jesus says, I am born with this purpose. So Jesus' answer is very interesting here too. So Pilate's one concern is to find out whether Jesus is the king of the Jews. And Jesus' answer is what? He is. However, he is not the king of this world. Does the vocabulary kind of sound familiar? He says, my kingdom is not of this world. Think about the, the, the message that we heard last week. In Jesus' high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, He says, I am praying for my disciples that they will be in the world, but He's praying that, that they will not be of the world. And these are the same words that Jesus is telling Pilate, I am a king, but I am not a king of this world. But I am a king of heaven. I, have the, I am the king of the spiritual realm. And I have king. So, and he repeats that two times. So we can see that Jesus is being faithful to his, what? Consecration. Jesus is being, re being faithful. He's remaining committed to what he prayed. What he prayed in his high priestly prayer. He is committed in being consecrated even at this trial. He's being tried 
for something that he didn't do anything wrong for. And there's people wanting him dead. But even in this critical point, he remains consecrated. He's saying, I am not a king of this world. And then Pilate insists, are you a king? Are you a king? So, are you a king? And Jesus says, for this purpose I was born. For this purpose I have come into the world. So what else is he being committed to? What else is he being faithful to? Not only to his consecration, but he is also being faithful to his commission. And he is saying, I have come with a mission. I have come with this very specific purpose that my Father had for me. And that is not to live as king in this world, but I have come with that very specific purpose to be king, but not to be king of this world. So let's see if Jesus is telling the truth. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. So Jesus says, I was born with a specific purpose. He was born as a king, but was he born with a specific purpose? Matthew chapter 2, verse 2. This is what the wise men, as they came worshiping him, as they came visiting him, seeing the star, this is what Matthew 2, 2 says. The master is saying, where is he who has been born, what? King of the Jews. Where is he who has been born King of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. And then what did King Herod said? Uh, Herod say at that time? He says, you know what? Tell me also. Tell me about this newborn King of Israel so that I may also go worship him too. And then what happens? He commits this mass massacre killing all the babies under two years old to get rid of this threat to his throne. So even at the very beginning of the birth of Jesus Christ, the king of the Jews was born, and because, of he, was, because he was born as a king of the world, or king of the Jews, there was already immediate conflict. Conflict over kingship, conflict over kingdom, conflict, conflict over throne and over the crown. So that's how his life began. As a king of the Jews, in conflict with the worldly king. And then how did he end his life? Turn to John chapter 19. John chapter 19. This is at the end of his life. Did he die as a king? Yes, he did. John chapter 19, verse 19. Let me read to you. So, all the trial has been done. Pilate tried him, tried him, and then the people wanted him dead. So he finally gives in and then decides to crucify him. Verse 17, John 19, verse 17. And he went out, bearing his own cross, to the place called the place of skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate, so this was the man who tried it. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. And it read, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather write, This man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What have I written? I have written. So until the very point of his death, he was born as a king of the Jews. The magicians came, the wise men came, looking for this boy born king of the Jews. And they wanted to come worship him. At the very end of his life, as he is dying, as he's hanging on the cross, literally nailed to the cross, he is dying as the king of the Jews. Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. And Pilate wrote it in three different languages, Aramaic, Latin, and in Greek. And all the, all the Jewish people were upset because it read, king of the Jews. 
So instead, what did they ask him to do? No, don't say king of the Jews. Right? He claims to be king of the Jews. But Paul said, no, what I wrote is what I have written. He is the king of the Jews. Isn't that astonishing? Jesus, born as a king of the Jews. He enters Jerusalem as a king of the Jews. People proclaiming, praising him as a king of the Jews. And at the very moment of his death, literally dying, bleeding to his death, he dies as the king of the Jews. Jesus was born as the king of the Jews, but in the most humble way. He did not, he did not, he, he did not lie in the palace, in the soft covers with servants tending him, but he was born as a humble king, humble king of the Jews, lying in the manger. He enters Jerusalem not as a glorious king riding on a war horse, but instead he entered in the most humble way, riding on a humble donkey. Something to be scoffed off on, but he does so in the most humble way. And he ends his life, not as a king, with a funeral of a royal king, everyone celebrating the death of, of a royalty, but he dies in the most humble and humiliating way on the cross. And Jesus did that. Why? Because he remained faithful to the two things that he's been praying for every day. He died. He, he, he was born. He lived. And he died committed to his consecration. Being separated from the world. And he remained faithful to his commission. Because he was born with a mission. With a very specific purpose that God had given him. And he ended his life fulfilling that very purpose that God had him for him, that God had for him. And he remained faithful as a humble servant. And my question for you and I this morning is this: What about your life? How faithful are you in your walk with the Lord? We see Jesus Christ, even though He is King of Kings, Lord of Lords, just as we have praised this morning. He was the king of the Jews, born king of the Jews. He enters his own city as the king of the Jews. He dies as the king of the Jews. But he did every one of that, being faithful to his very purpose, the Father's purpose, to obey the will of the Father. His life on this world was not wasted because he remained faithful. Faithfully separate, being in the world but not becoming of the world, but living with a purpose. And what purpose is that? To sacrifice, to give life as a result of his consecration, which we all share too. We share the same consecration. God didn't call us to be like the world, to love the world, be, be like exactly like the people of the world. Think like them, talk like them, walk like them, live like them. But, I have, but God has given us life so that we may be the salt and light in this dark and depraved generation. And we share the same commission. God has called us to go to the ends of the world, proclaim the gospel, Baptized, make disciples of Jesus Christ. How faithful are we? Well, Jesus, I mean, we can't be perfectly faithful, but God has set us an example to follow. The man who was born King of the Jews in the most humble way. And he lived everything in between the same way, exact same way that as he died on the cross. King of the Jews in the most humble way. But I want us to go a little bit further to show us how depraved we are as a sinner. A sinner. When you look into the history, this problem of kingship, the conflict of kingdoms, of this kingship, has been a problem all throughout the history of humankind. Look at chapter 18, verse 38. So as Jesus is being tried, this is what the people of Israel said. Chapter 18, verse 38. 
So now Jesus is being tried under Pilate. All the chief priests, all the leaders brought him into the Roman hands. And Pilate is questioning, are you king? Are you king? And then verse 38, this is what happens. Well, verse, verse 38, Pilate said to him, what is the truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in it. So Pilate is convinced that he has done nothing wrong worthy of his death. Verse 39, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release you who again? The king of the Jews? Verse 40, they cried out, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. So they're saying, you know, so Pilate wanted to release the king of the Jews. Wanted to release their king, but the people did not want him released. But they wanted a robber instead. But go on, look at verse 19, or chapter 19. Okay, I want you to see that recurring vocabulary over and over and over. Chapter 19. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. And they came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And struck him with, the, with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out of you, out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Jesus, so Jesus came out wearing crown of thorns and purple robe. Pilate said to him, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to him, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. So again and again, Pilate wants to release him, but the people wanted him dead. And then they make a, a crown of thorns. And I wasn't really uh, impacted by the crown of thorns until I came to Arizona, until I saw real thorns. You guys seen Arizona thorns, right? That are th that long in the desert. I would go walk, uh, I go hiking with my dogs and, with my dog and, you know, my dog would go under these, you know, you know cacti or, or, the, or these thorny bushes and it would come back with thorns in the paw and it would cry so hard and it would limp and it would, it would not go on, you know, because there's that long thorns that are, that are poking. Imagine wearing a crown of thorns like that in your head and they would probably push it down. They were beating him, flogging him, mocking him, taunting him, spitting at him, slapping him. And they were saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Look at verse 12. John chapter 19, verse 12. And then on Pilate, from then on Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So the Jewish people, they're so crafty. They're saying, if you release this man, you're not being a friend of Caesar because you are almost agreeing that this man is king, someone who is not Caesar. Verse 13. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat and played at a place called the Stone Pavement and in Aramaic Gabbatha. Now, it was the day of preparation for, of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him. Crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king again? Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. And these are the same people who cried out just a few days ago, waving the palm leaves, crying, King, welcome, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Jews. The very same people now crying, we have no king but Caesar. Who is Caesar? He's the emperor of Rome. They hated Rome. But instead they choose to follow Rome. Instead, they choose to worship 
Caesar as their king. Turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 8. The same problem happened thousands of years ago. 1 Samuel chapter 8. It's pretty fascinating how the history always repeats itself. So if you learn from your history, you will, you're bound to repeat it over and over. 1 Samuel chapter 8. So this is the Israelite nation and they had no kings then. They were ruled by the judges. God appointed judges. And God had the priests to govern the people. Verse 1. 1 Samuel chapter 8 verse 1. When Samuel, the high priest, became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. And then what did they do? Verse 3, yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. So immediately something wrong happens because you're not supposed to appoint judges by lineage. But Samuel did anyway. So he made his sons the judges to judge over Israel. And they were perverted. Uh, they perverted the justice and they took gains and they took bribes. Because with high power, you cannot exercise in uh, perfect justice because we're sinful. And then, look what people are saying. Look at verse 5. And, said, and all the elders of the Israel gathered and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Not appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. So people of Israel were not happy with the system that God has given them. The system of priests. The system of the judges. So people started demanding, give us a king. And what is the reason behind it? So that they could be like all other nations. Verse 6. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to, judges, to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. So God says, you know what? Listen to their cry. So let them have what they want. Because they didn't reject you as a priest. But in return, they have rejected me as their king. So God has set in place a system where he could be king over Israel. To be the protector, to be the provider, to be the righteous judge. To be the one who would fight for them, to be the one who would guard them and guide them in the truth. But God is saying, you know what, when they demand a king other than me, they're rejecting me as the good king. And then you can read the rest of the chapter. It's so fascinating. God tells them, you know what? Yes, they can have a king. I will give them a king. But just warn them that the king will need servants. And they will make their children their servants. And they will have to be slaves to serve their king. And they will, the kings will be unjust. But if they still want it, let them have it. And then they still have, no, we want the king. Because we want to be like the rest of the nations. Do you see the re resemblance here? People demanding a different king because they want to be like the world. John chapter 19, people demand a king other than someone other than Jesus Christ. Even if it's Caesar, the one that they hate, they still choose that over making God their king. Because why? Because they want the things of the world. The protections of the world. The provisions of the world. The security and the comfort of the world. Versus living as people consecrated. Right? God, When God chose the Israelites, God chose them for a specific purpose. Not to be like the rest of the world. But to be my people. To be God's people. To shine a light into the world. But the sinful people desire to be like the world. 
ultimately this results in rejecting God as their king. But I want to conclude my message here this morning. Your desire for the world, according to God, is equivalent to your rejection of God as your king, as your provider, as your security, as your guard, as your fortress, as the good shepherd, as the heavenly father. But we love to be our own king. And the world, all of the messages of the world, is telling us to be our own king. Look at what we wear. I like Nike a lot, but what is their slogan? What's Nike's slogan? Just do it. Just do what? Just do what? Just do what you want. Just do what pleases you. Now, I'm not saying don't wear Nike or anything like that, but just be mindful of the message. Right? And all the shows, all the TVs, all the movies, all the songs, are. you must be mindful of their message because their messages are about celebration of you. Celebration of mankind. Even Frozen 2, right? I don't know if you watched Frozen 2. Elsa follows his voice, a, a different voice that calls you out to fulfill a different purpose. But in the end, who is the Savior? It's you in the end. You are the one. I mean, I'm not saying those are harmful, but you must be mindful of the messages of the world. There's a song, I want to thank me. Snoop Dogg song. I want to thank me. It's me. It's all about me. I am my own king. Even what we eat. What's Burger King's slogan? You know, the slogan that they have had for the longest time since the 70s. Have it your way. Right? In the 90s, they, their slogan changed to your way right away. And then Burger King, you, where you are the boss. Be your way, your way. I mean, it's food. Yes, it's innocent. It's food we're talking about. But the message that is engraved in it, we must be mindful of. It's telling you to be your own king. And that's what exactly what Satan used to tempt and, and, and trick Adam and Eve. You know, he tricked, did God really say you will surely die? But if you eat this forbidden thing, you will be like God. You will be your own God. But the message of Jesus Christ is contrary. It is radically different. Even though He is all-powerful. Right? The people say, if you're all-powerful, you cannot be all-good. But God's message is radically different. It is almost opposite of what the world is telling us. He is all-powerful in a way that He is the Creator. He owns the heavens. He owns the earth. He owns everything. He owns all of us. If there's a, a strong wind, a gush of wind, a huge boat gets stuck in the uh, Suez Canal and we're all paralyzed. Oh no, what happens? If, if one thing, a volcano erupts, a small virus, you know, erupts, everything shuts down. Right? God owns everything. But did you know he is also perfectly good? And how does he display that? By that powerful king dying on your place. He has displayed the ultimate goodness by the ultimate powerful God not needing to die on the cross, but chooses to die on the cross on your behalf so that you and I can live. So that he takes our own place of judgment the wrath and the curse to make us live. He is all-powerful God and He is all-good God and He has displayed that on the cross. And this is the message that Jesus preached all His life. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. This is what He says. For even the Son of Man came not to be served as a king, but to serve and give His life as a ransom for he came to give. He didn't come to take. He didn't come to be served. But He came to give and give all. 
so that others may live. So as we live, as we go through this Passion Week, I want us to realign our consecration. Realign our purposes. Realign our goals. The reason you study so hard. The reason you want to get A's. The reason you want to do so well in your SATs. The reason you want to get a good paying job. Or get into a good paying, or good Ivy League schools and whatnot. Whatever that you want to do. Let's realign our purposes. To the same purpose that Jesus carried to the cross. To do the will of the Father. Not to take, not to be served, not to receive, but to give all so that others may live. Let's seek that one thing this week. As we give ourselves to prayer, as we give ourselves to the Word of God, let's live with this in mind. Let's serve this one King. And let's lay down our crowns before Him. Let's pray.